Great to be here with you guys. I'm glad. Uh, I mean, uh, as as unhappy as I am that all of this coronavirus stuff is happening and and I I can't be with my people. <laughs> um, it's it's great to be able to be here with you uh, to kind of share my story, uh, share kind of how the Lord has uh, worked in my life uh, to bring me where I am today. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma City. I was born and raised there uh, since since the time I was born. I, I was a parishioner at uh, Our Lady's Cathedral in Oklahoma City. I've, I've received uh, every sacrament there, um, including both my ordinations. Um, so it's uh, a blessing. It was a, it was a tremendous blessing for me uh, you know, last November when the the renovations were done and the cathedral was rededicated. It was a, a really beautiful moment to, to see, you know, the transformation of my, my childhood parish, um, the place where uh, my life with the Lord started uh, and where it was fostered and, and grew. Uh, to see it transformed in that way was beautiful. Um, and really, uh, <laughs> If I was to put my my vocation story in uh, the shortest way possible, I would I would say that I've wanted to be a priest since I was four. <laughs> uh, my dad tells the story um, of of me and and my two older I'm I'm the third of four kids. I have two older brothers and then one younger sister. Um, tells the story when I was about four, my older brothers were. Uh, six and 10. Um, all three of us said we were going to be priests. Um, <laughs> I'm the one who became a priest. <laughs> but, uh, you know, since since that that time when we were, were very little, I've always uh, kind of wanted to be a priest. Um, and I think, you know, back then it was, uh, it was kind of a, the dream right? Little kids uh, have dreams, what they want to do when they grow up. Uh, some want to be a doctor, some want to be, you know, a professional baseball player, some want to be a fireman, a soldier, whatever it might be. Uh, for me, that was to be a priest. Uh, along with, I was, my, my plan when I was, you know, six or seven, uh, was that I was going to be a priest, but I was also going to uh, play center field for the St. Louis Cardinals at the same time. Uh, I hadn't worked out the details of how that was going to happen, but it was. It was going to happen. Uh, obviously, my my baseball talent didn't pan out the way I thought it would. <laughs> but uh, you know, I I uh, I loved the Lord. Um, I loved the church. I loved going to church. Um, I grew up in Catholic schools. I went to uh, Bishop John Carroll uh, from the time I was in first grade. Uh, all the way through seminary, and even a couple years after I was done in seminary, uh, I was at a Catholic school as a student. <laughs> so, um, you know, Catholic education has been a huge part of uh, my life, a huge part of my, my story, a huge part of my vocation. Um, at the same time, going into Catholic schools and being a, a product of Catholic schools, uh, for a very long time, my uh, relationship with the Lord was what I would call a very academic one. Uh, I could tell you a lot about God. I could tell you a lot about the church. I could tell you a lot about Jesus. I could, you know, when I was in sixth and seventh grade, uh, I could name that I could rattle off the Ten Commandments by memory. I could rattle off the eight Beatitudes. I could name the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. I could, you know, name a lot of things. I could, I could tell you a lot of facts about uh, God. Um, but I'm not really sure I had a relationship with the Lord. Um, I loved serving Mass. Uh, it gave me something to do <laughs> uh, as a fourth grader, you know, who uh, sits in Mass and is a little bit bored sometimes. Uh, I loved being able to serve because it gave me something to do. It gave me something to focus on, uh, a way to engage, um, you know, and otherwise I probably wouldn't have engaged very much. Um, and then in eighth grade, 
two things happened that really uh, caused in me uh, a deep conversion, but also a realization of, of the Lord's will for my life. Uh, the first thing uh, was in November of that year. Uh, this was in 2002, so 18 years ago now almost. Um, in November of that year, my, my dad was ordained a deacon. Uh, so my, my dad is a permanent deacon. Uh, he serves now at, at Holy Spirit Parish in Mustang. Um, obviously then he was at Our Lady's Cathedral. Um, but my dad was ordained a deacon and my dad, you know, for, for my entire life has been uh, my hero, right? He's the, he's the one that I've looked up to, um, you know, since I was, since I was very little. Uh, he's always been, I wanted to be like my dad. Um, and so seeing him give his life uh, in that way, seeing him lay down his life in service to the church in that way, um, was big for me, right? It was important. Uh, it was important for my vocation. It was important for, for my relationship with God, uh, for my spiritual life. Um, and then about a month later, uh, perhaps the, the biggest, one of the most, certainly the most important event in my life, one of the most important events in my life <laughs> happened. Um, I came home from a uh, Boy Scout camping trip. I was involved uh, with Boy Scouts and we had gone uh, camping. And so I came home, I think it was like the first weekend in December, something like that. Um, and both my parents were there to pick me up uh, when I got home from this camp out. And, uh, you know, they, they told me uh, we, we should go uh, get some hot chocolate and, you know, being a 13 year old kid, I, I loved hot chocolate and I was like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> so uh, there, was a, there was a Starbucks nearby and we went over and, and uh, I got my hot chocolate and they got their coffee and, and we sat down and uh, my parents told me that I had been diagnosed with malignant melanoma, which is a form of skin cancer. Um, for about the previous six or seven years, I had, I had had a mole on my neck uh, and uh, it had been slowly growing over time. Uh, at that time, it was, it was about the size of a dime uh, at that point, um, that big around. And, and for seven years, we had been asking the doctors, you know, if there's, if <laughs> what it was, if we needed to get it checked, all of these things. And and for seven years, we had been told, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then finally, providentially, uh, when I was in eighth grade, we insisted, my parents insisted, you know, you need to get this checked. And so they took a small biopsy and they had sent it in. Um, and it came back positive for, uh, for melanoma, for skin cancer. Um, as a, as a, now a 30 year old um, person, I, I know a little bit more about cancer. <laughs> um, and I know that, you know, not every case of cancer ends in death. <laughs> but at the time, as a 13 year old, uh, that was kind of the experience that I had of cancer. If you get cancer, you die, right? Um, and so for me, it was kind of, it was kind of like receiving a death sentence. Um, you know, I, I, I knew uh, cancer uh, ended in death for many people, and, and it was terrifying, right? as you, I'm sure, can imagine. Um, it's not fun as a 13 year old kid getting told that you have uh, skin cancer. Um, but luckily and providentially, uh, the doctors uh, told us it's, it's not. Uh, to the point yet of spreading, they think. Um, so they, they said, we can probably remove it with surgery. Uh, we have to take out some lymph nodes in your neck. And uh, if, I guess the way it works is that the, the cancer goes there first, and then once it gets there, it spreads from there. Um, but if it doesn't get there, then it can't spread. So, uh, so I, I went into surgery about two weeks later. It was, uh, I remember it very distinctly. Uh, it was a Wednesday morning. <laughs> it was December 18th, exactly a week before Christmas. Um, 
I went into surgery. I, they removed six lymph nodes in my neck. Um, they, I mean, cut open my head, <laughs> my neck for, you know, probably a seven or eight inch scar that I have now. Um, when they, I, I walked around with my head tilted like this for about the next three months as, <laughs> as things went back to normal. But, uh, um, I went into surgery and they, they took out the lymph nodes and they, they had to send them off to a lab and they said it was going to be, you know, several days before, before they got the results and could tell me <laughs> whether or not, um, it had spread or was going, was spreading. Um, and so for that, uh, you know, really the two weeks leading up to that and, and the three or four days after that uh, was perhaps, well, it definitely was the most terrifying time of my life. Um, really not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing whether I was going to live or die, um, and just having that uncertainty. And really, uh, for the first time in my life, I experienced a situation over which in my mind, I had no control, right? The reality was there were many things that I had no control over and I just hadn't realized it yet. <laughs> Being a you know, 13 year old who knew everything and could solve any problem. <laughs> um, and for the first time, I really thought to myself, like there's nothing that I can do. There's nothing within my power to change what's happening or what's going to happen in the next, you know, several weeks, months, years, whatever. Um, but I had, you know, been in school. I had been in Catholic school. We had gone to religion class for the last, you know, almost eight years. I had been told over and over and over again. I had heard from my parents. I had heard from the priest at mass. I had heard all of these things that apparently there was this God who could control it. <laughs> and apparently this God who could control it uh, loved me and wanted the good for me. Uh, and so the first time, for the first time in my life, I really truly prayed. Um, and I turned to God and I said to him, uh, Lord, there's nothing that I can do to control this situation. Uh, but apparently you can, so you're going to have to take care of it. Um, and after I did that, I just kind of let it go. <laughs> Uh, which looking back is a tremendous grace from the Lord to be able to just let go and, and to say like, you know, I'm not going to worry about this because there's nothing I can do. Um, so about three or four days later, it was, uh, I believe December 23rd. Uh, it was either the 23rd or the 24th. Um, my parents got a phone call from the doctors that, said that the tests had come back uh, negative. So I was gonna be fine. Uh, obviously this is uh, the best Christmas present I've ever received <laughs> was this uh, you know, clean bill of health or, or relatively clean bill of health, knowing <laughs> you know, at least that I was going to live uh, and that I was gonna be fine. Um, you know, best news I've ever received. Um, And it was really a poignant moment for me, uh, particularly in my vocation story. Uh, you know, this was, this was definitely my conversion to the Lord. That was definitely the, the moment in which I knew uh, without a doubt that, that God was there, that he loved me, that he, he was there for me, that he wanted my good, um, and that he was working for my good actively. Um, and so it was definitely the key moment in my conversion really to the faith, even though I had been, you know, Catholic my whole life. Um, but also in my vocation, um, you know, and I've obviously I've had uh, almost 18 years now to reflect on this moment, um, this, this uh, experience in my life. And when I was in seminary, I uh, was praying about it. And I realized that what was happening is that the Lord was, was saying to me, uh, here's your life back. Uh, and now I want you to give it to me. And so from that moment on, it was kind of, I, I knew um, that the Lord wanted me to give my life to him, uh, that the Lord wanted me uh, 
to make that gift of myself uh, out of love for him. Uh, and so, you know, all throughout uh, high school, uh, the rest of that year, the rest of eighth grade, all throughout high school at Bishop McGinnis, uh, I, that was my thing. <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was headed towards the priesthood. I was headed towards the seminary. Um, one of the, one of the beautiful things that I had an opportunity to do uh, when I was at McGinnis, you know, at McGinnis, they've, we've got a, there's a chapel there and and uh, when I was there three times a week, we had daily mass. We had uh, different priests that came in, Father Joe Irwin, uh, uh, Father Tang Nguyen from the cathedral, um, a couple other priests during my time there. Uh, they would come in and three days a week, we would have daily mass. Um, and I was blessed to be able as a work study uh, to kind of be in charge of the chapel. I was kind of like the sacristan. <laughs> so I would come in uh, those three days a week. I would set up for mass. I would serve at the mass. Um, I would be there, you know, if the priest needed anything. Um, I would serve all of the all school masses, um, kind of lead that uh, part of it. Um, I would go in two or three days a week after school um, and I would uh, sweep and mop the chapel. I would change out, you know, votive candles. I would vacuum the carpet and the, and the foyer going into the chapel and all those things. Um, and looking back, it was a huge blessing for me because it gave me an opportunity to really just spend time with the Lord. Um, and I think spending that time with the Lord being just in his presence, even if I wasn't actively engaged in prayer, even if I wasn't sitting there actively in conversation with the Lord, um, just being in his presence opened my heart uh, to receive all of that grace that the Lord was wanting to give me. Um, and so during that time, uh, it was just a huge blessing for me to be able to, to continue uh, over those years of high school to grow in my relationship with the Lord, to grow in my understanding uh, of his will for me, um, and to continue to pursue that that vocation to the priesthood. Uh, I graduated uh, from Bishop McGinnis in 2007. And uh, that fall, I began my seminary formation at, at Conception Seminary College in Northwest Missouri, um, where a number of our seminarians uh, go. And, and I know you might be able to say most of our priests attended there at some point <laughs> in their life. Um, so Benedictine Monastery up in, in Northwest Missouri, north of Kansas City. Um, and over those four years, uh, you know, that call just continued, continued, continued um, until the very end uh, of my time at Conception. Um, you know, during my time at Conception, obviously, we were surrounded and kind of our lives were kind of permeated with this Benedictine way of life. Um, this Benedict, you know, the, everything was informed by uh, the rule of St. Benedict and the, the life of the monks and all of these things. Um, and there was something about that that drew me. There was something about that that attracted me. Um, and so during my last year there, I was really praying a lot about that. And I, I thought that I, you know, really should pursue that should pursue discerning a vocation to the monastic life. Uh, and so actually it was uh, the day that Archbishop Coakley was installed as our Archbishop, <laughs> I met with uh, Father Novak, who was the vocation director at the time, uh, and told him, you know, this was in February, and I told him, uh, you know, I was, graduate I was gonna be graduating from Conception uh, that May. And I said, after I graduate, um, you know, I, I, Feel like the Lord is calling me to leave uh, and pursue monastic life uh, to to join a monastery, and I was I was planning on joining uh, the monastery out in Shawnee at St. Gregory's. Um, and uh, you know, I had been I had been talking with him before about this a little bit, and so he told me, you know, I'm not really surprised that this is happening. <laughs> But he said, uh, Archbishop Coakley is going to want to, uh, Archbishop Coakley is going to want to meet with you before, <laughs> before you make this decision final. Uh, 
and I, you know, I said, of course, I, that makes perfect sense. I definitely think that should happen. Uh, and so our church with Coakley met with me uh, a few weeks later. Uh, he was, he had come up to conception. He was on the board of regents at the time and he met with me and, um, you know, it was the first time I really interacted with him uh, in a, in a personal way. And, um, you know, his guidance and his advice, he at one point in his vocation story, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, uh, had uh, discerned a monastic vocation as well. So he knew kind of where I was coming from. Um, and uh, after talking to me for a while, he said, it sounds like what you need uh, is a year away from uh, academics, a year away from the pressure of grades and all of this stuff. Uh, to really focus on your prayer and discern your vocation. Uh, and I said, yeah, that, <laughs> that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, and he told me that uh, they were planning on sending a group of us, uh, about, I think, four of us, uh, to uh, a, a different sem a di a seminary we hadn't used in our diocese in a very long time uh, out in Denver, Colorado, at St. John Vianney Seminary. And the unique thing about that uh, seminary is that the first year there, the first year of formation is, is not spent in academics. It's, it's, they call it a spirituality year. So it's a year uh, solely focused on growing in prayer, solely focused on discernment of vocations on, uh, you know, we had classes, we went over, you know, spiritual classics. We went through the whole Bible in a year. We, we talked about the different um, documents of the Second Vatican Council, things like that. Um, but the main focus of the year was to grow in prayer. Um, and so it was kind of, you know, a, a huge blessing to be able, I didn't have to worry about grades. I didn't have to worry about, you know, all of the, the normal pressures that come with uh, school, the normal pressures that come with, you know, just typical seminary life. Um, and I could just really focus on my relationship with God and, and really listen hard. Um, and discern well what the Lord was calling me to do. Um, and the kind of the capstone, the, the final thing, uh, the thing that the whole spirituality year leads up to uh, is a 30-day silent retreat uh, by uh, using the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Um, and so we ended that year starting in the middle of May and going through the middle of June, uh, we went to a little retreat center in Iowa, about 40 miles east of Omaha, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. And for basically for the month, we were silent. <laughs> um, we had mass every day. Um, and I met, with a, I met with a spiritual director every day for those 30 days um, for about... 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and other than that, the whole month was spent in silence and in prayer with the Lord. Um, and there were, you know, reflections and, and a lot of prayer with scripture, a lot of um, discernment, you know, all those kind of things uh, during that 30 days. Um, and during that retreat, uh, and really throughout the whole, the whole spirituality year, but especially during that retreat, the Lord made it very, very, very clear to me <laughs> that uh, he wanted me to be a priest in a parish. He wanted me to be a diocesan priest. He wanted me to um, you know, lay down my life in that way, in that specific way for the church. Um, and so that was kind of, St. Ignatius calls it the moment of election, right? <laughs> the moment where the Lord really makes it clear to you uh, what he's chosen you for, uh, the vocation that he's chosen for you and that he's giving to you. Um, and kind of the opportunity that he gives you, gives me, <laughs> to accept and to choose to elect that vocation. Um, and so from that time on, <laughs> it was kind of, you know, in, in my mind, my discernment was done. <laughs> I was, this was what the Lord had for me. And, uh, you know, the only way that, uh, the only way that that was going to change is if the bishop said no. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, discernment is that, that two-way street, right? There's the, the discernment of the, of the individual who's responding to the vocation, um, 
you know, there's my discernment. I discerned that the Lord was calling me to be a priest. Um, but there's also the aspect that the church is also discerning my vocation, right? Uh, and particularly the person of the bishop, you know, is discerning for the church, <laughs> whether this man is called to be a priest. Um, and so I just kind of left it there. And I said, you know, unless, unless the bishop says no, or God puts a billboard that says, John Paul Lewis, you are not called to be a priest on the highway, <laughs> then, you know, that's what I'm pursuing. Um, and it really gave me a lot of freedom over the next four years uh, to give myself over uh, to preparation, right? To preparation and formation for uh, the priesthood. Um, and so those last four years uh, in Denver uh, were super blessed. Uh, I loved all of the classes. I loved the formation. I, I you know, made great friends. Um, Archbishop Coakley uh, allowed me. I asked at one point if, if uh, I could do this special training program that they have uh, there in Denver uh, for spiritual directors. Um, you know, giving, experiencing spiritual direction. And, and I feel like as I, you know, prayed about my priesthood and about the things that the Lord was calling me to do, I think spiritual direction came up over and over and over again as something that I really felt called to by the Lord. Um, and uh, there was a, a place in Denver run by the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, which is a religious order uh, there. Uh, they provide a program that trains spiritual directors. And so, um, you know, I asked Archbishop Coakley if, along with all of my seminary studies, if I could go through that training program. Um, and he thankfully said yes and allowed me to do that. And so, uh, you know, I was able to be trained as a spiritual director and that way I can, uh, as my spiritual directors all helped me to discern my vocation and, and see where the Lord was leading me. Um, now I'm able to help other people do the same, um, you know, in a very big way. And so um, spiritual direction has become for me a, a beautiful way of living my priesthood along with, along obviously with being in the parish. Um, so I was ordained uh, a priest in 2016, June of 2016. Uh, and uh, my first assignment was at St. Charles Borromeo Catholic Church and School uh, there in Oklahoma City. It was a beautiful two years. I loved uh, my time there. I loved the people there. I loved being able to go over to the school and to, to work with the kids, uh, to teach you know, some of their classes over there, to just be present to them and, and to show them you know, a father's love, uh, the father's love, hopefully. <laughs> um, and uh, then after two years, I was sent out uh, uh, with uh, another priest, Father Christopher Bashirs. Um, the two of us were sent out together to uh, the panhandle uh, of Oklahoma. And I've, I've been there for the last two years. And, and uh, again, I've, I've fallen in love with the parish. I've fallen in love with the people. Um, it's, it's a much different assignment. Uh, when I was at St. Charles, uh, you know, we, we had the one parish and the school and um, you know, that was, that was our mission, was, was that one city block. Uh, and obviously the geographical area around it, the, the people that lived near us. Um, now I am uh, one of three priests that covers the entire panhandle of Oklahoma. <laughs> All three counties, we've got, uh, you know, if you drove from one end of our parish to the other, uh, it would probably take about three hours or more, uh, <laughs> just going east to west. Um, only about 30 minutes north to south, but, um, you know, three hours east to west. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we cover a lot of territory, uh, and, and yet the people out there are so um, beautiful, and they're, the, the work that the Lord has been doing uh, in that place for a while, and in particularly in the last two years, um, has been beautiful. Uh, and the Lord has, has shown me uh, in many ways, uh, you know, how he's using me and my experience in particular uh, to show his love to people um, and to, to bring, you know, the gospel to them, to help form them as disciples. Um, 
And it's just been, you know, all four years of my priesthood <laughs> have just been uh, beautiful. Uh, and I love this vocation. I love that the Lord has called me to this. Um, I wouldn't, wouldn't change it for the world. I wouldn't change it for anything. Um, and, you know, I'm just excited uh, that the Lord would use me uh, the way that he uses me. So, yeah, so that's my story. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if there's anything else that you want me to talk about, Peter, but... Um, well, the John Paul, that's, that's perfect. I would just yeah. like to offer, we've got about five or six minutes. If anybody in the group has any questions <coughs> for Father John Paul, certainly welcome. Uh, any questions? One of the things that fascinates me about your story, actually, is that you knew early. I don't hear a lot of priests say that anymore, where you, you kind of had it in your heart of hearts that early on you knew your path. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's funny, you know, there's there's a lot of guys in the seminary, they've, they've got different different words that they say for different people. And, <laughs> you know, you have your, your people who are like 60 and, and in the seminary and, you know, they're later life vocations. Um, you know, I'm, I'm what they refer to as a lifer. <laughs> uh, you know, the guys who enter right after high school and, and are in, um, I think my entire time in seminary, I was the youngest person in my class, uh, just because my birthday's in July. So I'm, <laughs> you know, uh, towards the end of my class. So I was always the youngest in my class and, um, you know, but, you know, the Lord, uh, I, I see it as a tremendous blessing <laughs> that the Lord, you know, would, would give me that gift of knowing from such a young age and not having to, you know, I know a lot of people uh, struggle for a long time <laughs> in discerning the Lord's will. And, and I know that a lot of people, you know, it becomes a big frustration for them. Uh, thank the Lord. You know, he knew I couldn't handle that frustration, so he just <laughs> allowed me to to know from a very early age uh, and to say yes. That's great. Is there any advice that you'd give us as <clears throat> lay women and men to to in how we might talk to a, a young man thinking about or who's not yet thinking about seminary and priesthood? Yeah, uh, yeah, and that was definitely part of my. Uh, part of my discernment and part of my, you know, discovering my vocation was people in the parish. I'm, there's, there's one woman in particular, uh, a parishioner from the cathedral. Her name was Gail Ferguson. She's passed away now, but um, she was close to our family, but uh, she used to tell me, um, you know, when I was up there serving, I would, I would, I altar served a lot. I loved, I loved being an altar server. And I would always, Every, every Sunday we would sit down in our seat and I would sit on the end where I could see the sacristy door and I would just pray that one of the servers wouldn't show up so that I can go back and serve mass. <laughs> That's my sons. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she used to tell me, um, you know, she said, when you're up there serving, it draws people into prayer. Um, and just that affirmation of, of something that I didn't, I wasn't doing intentionally. I was just, <laughs> you know, doing my thing. And it, it, so if you recognize that in someone, um, if you recognize that in someone at your parish, if you, if you look at them and it, it draws you to the Lord, if, if you look at them and it, you know, helps to direct you towards prayer, um, tell them, <laughs> don't be afraid to go up to them and say, Hey, just so you know, uh, you being here, <laughs> helps to draw me into prayer. And I think you have a gift for that. Um, you know, maybe you should think about being a priest. Um, you know, be bold <laughs> when you're, when you think there's someone in your parish that has a vocation, uh, don't hesitate to tell them. Don't hesitate to pester them. <laughs> um, because, you know, like, like Jesus says, consistency and persistence is, is important. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, just don't be afraid to, to let people know um, when you recognize a gift that they have uh, and think that that gift is being uh, asked to be in service to the church, tell them. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Father, we're about out of time. Uh, if we're going to get to the 1130 Mass, yeah. give us your, uh, your blessing, please. Absolutely. 
And let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and for the many blessings you've given us. Thank you in particular for the grace of our vocations uh, that you've given to each and every one of us. We ask that you would bless the work of uh, this Sarah Club, um, bless the work of all those who are in part of it, um, that through their work, through their prayer, uh, through their efforts, you may bless your church with abundant fruit, uh, that you may help young people uh, and people of any age to discover what the Lord is asking them to do um, and help them by giving them the grace to respond. And we ask all this uh, through Christ our Lord. Amen.